Okay, I'm really happy to welcome you tonight to our first event for 2023. Um, my name is Martha Gellhart. For those of you who don't know, I'm the chapter president and proud of you. Um, this is the fifth year of our winter speaker hearings. It's been popular through the years, of course, for obvious reasons. The last two years were Zoom only. Um, prior to that, it was in person only. So tonight is our first uh, hybrid, they call it. And um, even our senior poet, which we would not be doing it, I would say, did we not have Dawn <laughs> our <laughs> vice president and tech guru? Yay! Yay! Um, and and then, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, that this will be recorded. You will be able to find it on others. Will be able to find it on our YouTube channel. And meanwhile, by the way, there are still uh, three. The three presentations from last year are still up on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, you might enjoy going on over there and and looking at some of those. Before we get to the presentation, I want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about uh, our chapter and, and the goings on, uh, share some pride and excitement uh, that, that you all should share as, as your part in the chapter. Um, nationally, we have close to 400 members. We are still the largest chapter in the country. Um, and that's a, that's a lot of folks. And um, <laughs> FYI, regarding the dues that we all pay, because we are so well established, um, three quarters of our dues go to national to support the national programming, you know, their organizational expenses, and then in turn their support of the other 76 chapters, 26 seedling chapters, you know, those that are just beginning in 29 states plus the country. And then also just more broadly their um, advocacy that they do on a national level. So you are all contributing significantly to the tune for our chapter of about $11,000. We are supporting nationalist work for the mission. So, so be proud. Um, locally, we've got a few new things happening this year. One is that it's our fifth anniversary of this chapter's founding. So we will have um, an in-person celebration that members will be invited to, where we'll honor our founders, Scott Woodbury, uh, as well as there are three founding members who are still active for our chapter. Penny Holtzman, Fran uh, Glass, who may be in um, and Kathy Dillon. So, yes, that, that'll be a very fun and, and proud thing that, that we'll do later this year. Another new thing is our mentorship program. Some of you may be aware that there was a pilot last year, piloted by board member Kate Lovelady, and it went well and it's ready for expansion. So, you'll soon be seeing folks about. Um, inviting you to apply to be a mentor or a mentee. So stay tuned for that. Um, we will also have our first volunteer appreciation um, celebration for 50 plus members who work on in one way or another to uh, support the chapter and the mission in 2022. Pretty noteworthy. And then we also, another new thing that we've been seeing a bit about is we are about ready to launch an in online store to sell our native plant ID tags, which I think you've been seeing some of those of you who are in person tonight, you see, um, you see, you can purchase them tonight, see examples of them. Um, and then just a, a few reminders about our ongoing program, our usual programming. Um, in addition to the speaker series, it's our garden gatherings monthly, April through October. Um, and every month we do two, one on Wednesday, one on Saturday morning, sort of fits more people's schedules. Um, 
We will again partner with two major uh, landscaping events opportunities. Uh, one of them being Partners for Native Landscaping, which I know a number of you are aware of. Again, this year there will be 10 um, webinar presentations through the St. Louis Community College. No, through the St. Louis County Library. I get the S and L's and C's. And those will all be in March. <laughs> of course, that will be free. Um, we are also going to revive the in-person half day workshop, and it'll be at Powder Valley, and that will be in April. And then also in April, Partners for Native Landscaping will have a second, their second um, plant sale and fair in April. So stay tuned. You'll be getting word about all of it, of course, through our uh, our read all about it online newsletter. Um, Native Plant Garden Tour will happen again. We partnered with the St. Louis Audubon Society Bring Conservation Home for the Native Plant Garden Tour. And this year it's going to be in May, May 21st. That should be a nice, nice thing to look forward to. Real quickly, more broadly, you know, in this time of nothing growing and time for us to be growing our knowledge base, if you will. Uh, just remember that grow native. We're trying to sort out a sound issue. Oh. Um, grow native is, you know, it's um, the, it the educational and marketing program for Missouri Prairie Foundation. And we are a silver sponsor of Grow Native. I encourage you to go on their website. There are all kinds of resources there. Oh, yeah. And they have uh, master classes, webinar master classes, which, because our chapter is a silver sponsor, we members can attend those master classes for free. So keep all of that in mind. Um, that's what happened. And then another SLC combination, the St. Louis Community College in the San I mean it. Um, <laughs> there are a number of interesting classes that you may or may not have seen coming up there. Um, a number of them uh, are by instructors who are involved with our chapter, either partnering and or members. Names you'll recognize, many of you. Um, Dave Tilka. Dan Pearson, who's the coordinator of in Conservation Home, uh, Susie Vandery, and then our own Sue Lady, who's doing two classes this year, this semester, one of which is the three hour version of what you're going to hear tonight. So, just things, opportunities to be aware of. And now, moving on to tonight's program. I'll introduce Sue, uh, a board, longtime board member. Her topic, as you know, I'm sure, is to create your own native garden. Her description, you probably saw on, on our website, is geared to beginners with minimal native plant knowledge. She said, if you want to go native but aren't sure how to get started, this is for you. We'll discuss site evaluation, plant selection and placement, tips to keep your garden looking tidy. So while she emphasizes that it's for beginners, I know that there are a number of folks here tonight who are not beginners and folks who are at, at home on Zoom who are not beginners, but still choose to come and hear Zoom because they know that they will hear some things that they didn't know already and be inspired. So take it away, Zoom. Okay. Um, as Martha mentioned, I normally teach this class at the community college, so there are parts of it I'm going to go through a little fast. This is interactive. If you have a question, please feel free to ask it. Okay? If, we, if it gets too bogged down, we'll have to do something else, but I like answering the questions as we go along. Okay? Um, we've got all this technology that's new, so we're looking at work. Okay. Um, Hopefully you can see that um, it says plant for functionality. <laughs> so um, when we're planting a native plant garden, 
And how many of you read one of Doug's books? Oh, most of you. Okay, if you haven't, write it down. Uh, Talamy, T A L L A M Y. He's got two of them, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, either one. Both of them talk about the importance of native plants for insects and the web of life. Okay. So, um, whether you want to capture water with the rain garden, provide food and cover for birds if you're a birder, nectar and pollen for pollinators, food, and food for insects and caterpillars. Somebody tell me what a pollinator is. <laughs> Name a pollinator. Butterfly. Butterfly. Bee. 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 Ants. Birds. Ants. Birds. 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 Climate on their geckos. <laughs> okay, you also want to plant for succession. Um, somebody blooming from spring through fall. This is the thin garden, by the way, if you're wondering. Um, the upper left is early spring. Only mated queen bumblebees survive the winter. They come out first thing early in the spring and they're looking for food, and then they start making the nest. So very important that you have something blooming early for those queen bees. And then your garden will advance. And then this is a this is a late summer picture. This is this is a rain garden, by the way, a small rain garden. There's too many things in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very important. You've probably heard this. If you have a right plant, right place. Very, very important. Um, evaluate your yard. Do you have sun? Do you have shade? Do you have partial? What's your soil like? Is it clay? Is it loam? Is it rocky? Most people in St. Louis don't have sandy soil, but it's possible. Um, moisture. Is it dry? Is it wet? Does it rain well after it rains? Drainage. Okay. First of all, sun. If you're not sure about the sun patterns in your yard, find a day when you can go out and take photos every two hours. So that you can go back and look and figure out what your sun and shade patterns are. What happens if you put a sun loving plant in the shade? Okay. It'll go dry. It's going to flop, yes. And eventually it's not going to do anything. What happens if you put a shade loving plant in the sun? Ooh. It's going to crow. Yeah. <laughs> um, Drainage, especially if you're considering a rain garden. The only way you're going to know this, folks, is to put on your raincoat and get your umbrella and go out when it's raining like today and watch how water flows across your property. Okay, figure out where it's coming from. A rain garden is designed to intercept water before it gets to the low spot in your yard. It is not in the low spot. Come in this Okay, look at your yard and your neighbors. You need you need to hide your neighbor's trash cans. You need to hide the junkie old clunker back behind the garage. Um, do you have something you like looking at that you would like to frame? Most of this is done with shrubs, by the way. We're not going to talk a lot about shrubs tonight. Um, okay, after you looked at your yard, Decide what type of garden you would like that's appropriate for your landscape. Do you want a bird garden? Because you're a birder. Do you want to focus on butterfly host plants? Do you want to get a lot of dry, rocky soil? Good for a glade garden. A rock garden. And the difference here, glade garden is dry, rocky soil in the soil. A rock garden is where you bring rocks in and make a pile, and then you put the dirt on top of it, and you plant in between the covers. That's the difference. Some of the plants are the same. Um, a pollinator garden, especially if you want to support the bees. Bees have to pollinate a third of the food that we eat. All fruits and most vegetables have to be pollinated by a bee. And we're talking native bees. We are not talking honey bees. So no bees, no food. It's not very interesting food. Um, a rain garden. Sensory garden. If you have kids or grandkids, 
A sensory garden is fabulous. These are things that you can touch, smell, hear, maybe even taste. Um, so think of them exposed to native plant gardens. Shade garden, what shade or dry shade? Um, or do you want to do a water garden? A bubbler, mostly for the birds. Fish pond or frog pond, there are two totally different things. One type of garden does not exclude another. You can have a good pollinator garden in dry, rocky soil. A pollinator garden can be good bird habitat. A bird garden can have butterfly host plants. A rain garden can be an excellent pollinator garden. And a sensory garden can also have a pollinator or butterfly host plants. Now, you picked up the greenscape guide that I handed you when you came in and picked up. I am native plant manager at Greenscape Gardens, for those of you who don't know. Um, but I did this work for you. There's sections in this book. There's a section on pollinator. There's a section on dry, rocky soil. There's a section on dry shade. There's a section on butterfly host plant. So I already did all that work. The Deer Free Guide. I know a lot of people have trouble with deer. <laughs> Okay, so the Deer Free Guide. I'm going to say one word about this guide. The deer haven't read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been put together by department managers at Greenscape who, through our experience, have determined that given a choice, either things the deer will most likely leave alone. Now, I've had reports of deer eating goldenrod and rattlesnake master, which are things that deer normally would not touch. All I can say to that is those deer are starving. <laughs> and when you have starving deer, they have to eat something. So there are a few things that are relatively safe even for starving deer. One is the Amsonias. And blue stars. Another is Monardas. Another is anything that's got mint in the name. So, and they're not always true mint. We're talking Calumet, Slender Mountain, mint, Ohio Horse Mint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are pretty safe no matter what. And aromatic acid. Um, if you look in the, in the Dreamscape Guide, You'll notice these plants serve multiple purposes, and I'm just going to pick on aromatic aster as an example. Asters are listed on the pollinator garden page. Okay. Aromatic aster is also listed under dry, rocky soil because it tolerates dry, rocky soil. It's also on the butterfly host plant page, the host of the silvery checker spot. And it's on the deer resistant list because it tends to be deer resistant. So, these plants can serve multiple purposes. You're going to have to do a little research. You can look these plants up in a couple of places. One is the Grow Native Plant Database, grownative.org. Fantastic website. And you can sort the database, shade for sun for color. If you want a particular color, you can sort it for color. Um, lots of ways you can filter that search. Um, and the Botanical Garden Plant Finder at mobot.org. Both, both places will tell you a lot about these plants. How big they, how tall they get, how wide they get, when they bloom, what color they are. Are they, do they tend to be deer resistant? What's the best soil type for them? Are they drought tolerant? And so on and so on. Just a, an aside to, so on the, on the mobot side, you have to click on gardens and gardening. And then plant finder is underneath yeah, that. Gardens and gardens or you can plants. always put a plant name in a search box. Yeah. Oh, my time is missing again. Well, this is called laying out your garden. Um, if you are planting trees or shrubs, please call 811 or 1-800-Z-Site. You do not want to hit a water line, an electric line, a sewer line, or anything else that's going to cause you major trouble. This is only true for trees and shrubs. Perennials, we don't plant deep enough to be a problem. And we're not going to talk a lot about trees and shrubs, but I 
want to make that point that you are planting a spear in trouble. Please, even if you are sure, so there is nothing there. Pollinate. You can click back to this. Um, start small. Don't bite up more than you can see. You can always expand your garden later. Remove the grass from your selected garden site. There's three ways to go about this. You can spray it with an herbicide on the roundup. I know a lot of people don't like that. I just throw it out there as an option. You usually have to spray twice for it to be effective. You can remove grass manually. This is the go-to shovel at our house. Okay, my husband actually, I'm not touching it, he sharpens it on his grinder. So, but when you're going to remove grass manually, you go down about four inches so you can get underneath the grass roots, and then you have to scrape this way. And it's hard work. So can you do that higher so people only can see kind of the motion? Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, get Andy up here to get it. So find a you know, an able-bodied young person that you can pick up and move your grass. <laughs> or be prepared for a good workout. Um, the third option, this is the one I usually recommend to people, is to solarize your grass. Um, cover it with cardboard and several inches of mulch. It takes about three months to kill the grass doing it that way. But, good news, this is January. If you go home and do this this weekend, you can plant in April. It's gonna be great. Okay. Um, so do not kill. I know that's a big temptation, and I did it once. It was a big mistake. It brings up dormant weed seeds. You do not want to kill. Okay. Yes. So with the with the taking the side off. The, the downside of that is that you you are also taking somewhat of the beneficial microbes. Maybe is that maybe a, maybe a little bit, but if you if you if you go down just far enough to get under your grass, it's not going to be a huge problem. Okay. Then you got to get rid of it. Yeah, you have to get rid of it. That's the other <laughs> and it's heavy. You can start throwing it in your yard waste trash can. They're going to come after you. You can only go about this far. You can't because it's very heavy. Okay. You can always flip it over. Um, yes, you could flip it over, but sometimes that just lets the grass be grow. I heard some people take it out. Even if it takes you several weeks to get rid of it. Or give it to your neighbors who have bare spots to fill in in their yard. <laughs> okay. Curves are better than straight lines. Sometimes you have to do a straight line. Um, especially if you have a garden wall or some garden wall, okay? But if you have an option, curves just let your eye flow more easily around the landscape. So wherever it's possible, you do a curve, do a curve. Plant in layers. Um, all stuff, either in the center or the back of the bed, depending on how you're going to be looking at that. Um, pretty obvious. The tallest plant should be no more than half the width of your bed. Otherwise, it will look out of proportion. Stagger your planting heights. That provides interest in the garden. You get mm -hmm. It just creates some interest in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, so when you've got uh, a thin narrow bed like that, like against a structure, you're going to have to have some of them that are taller though, right? I mean, because a lot of times if you're trying to, if, if it's got a lot of bed. I see. So it's okay. One of those distances. Right. Right. I was trying to okay. visualize and I couldn't. <laughs> How many of you heard the mantra sleep, creep, leave? Sure. Only a couple of you? Oh, no more of you. Okay. It's very much Native gardening teaches you to be patient. Mm -hmm. um, the first year that plant is going to not do much because it's busy putting down roots into the ground. It's just not going to do much on top. The second year, mm -hmm. the creep year, get a little growth, a little flowering, but it's still busy establishing its food base. 
The third year is the leap year. They're going to take off with their growth and their flowering. Um, the good news is a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times the plants you buy in the garden center are already second year plants. You don't have to wait quiet and long. Leave room for plants to grow. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is the biggest mistake people make with native gardening is to not give that plant room to grow. It's not going to leap till year three. And when it does, if you have stuff too close to it, you're just going to be fighting. Okay? See this? And yes, I did that. <laughs> that is an aromatic aster. No, I'm sorry. No, I can't. A fragrant sumac. Sugang. Yeah. 10 to 12 feet high and wide. We did not leave it enough room from the house or from this other tree that's over here. We fought with it. <laughs> For, for four or five years, trying to prove it, tie it up, whatever. We finally said it's not working. It's not working. So we took it out, and it's been replaced by a black chokeberry, which fits the state a whole lot better. But that's a good example of leave room for your plants to grow. It's true of perennials, too. I know that's a shrub, but it's true of perennials, too. Okay. Very, very important. Don't get goopy, goopy tools in the harvest. <laughs> That's all I can say. Go on, like get a good soil knife with a serrated edge. This happens to be an AM Leonard. I'm not telling that particular brand, but what I have at work is a Fenfi, FB and FBI. But get a good, good soil knife. The other thing you need is a pair of snippets. They're sold almost everywhere in garden centers. I get mine online from garden supply company, but these, this I use for planting. This is on my, in my pocket all the time, walking around the garden. You never know when you're gonna have to snip something off, or, you know, it's just handy to have. But you want good ones. Clean them. Huh? Clean them. Oh yes, keep them clean. Do not put a knife back in a, in a sheet dirty. You clean it first and store it in the sheet. Okay. Um, I read the riot act to a couple of people at work who used my soil knife and just put it back there and they got rid of the riot act. Okay. Recognize these? Mm -hmm. Grow native tag. Mm -hmm. If you buy plants to a reputable place, a reputable grower will have put these tags. In the pot. The reputable growers all belong to Grow Native. They buy the tags from them. There are not tags for every single native plant out there, but if you see a fair number of these in the garden center or the display, then you know that they're they're working it. Okay, these tags also very valuable. Tell you height, width, when it blooms, uh, what color it is. As you can see that from the picture on the front. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of time. Um, so Read anyway, them. yes. Throw it in tank, very important. Read them. Read them, yes. It also tells you what plant to go with it, the same type of habitat. This is another example of when we plants with the grow. And this was a shrub bed that we put in. And this is right after planting. And it looks pretty bare, right? The temptation here is to stick more stuff in there. But three years later, on the right, look at it. If I had so come to the temptation to put stuff in there, I would have been fighting with it three years later. Just really can't emphasize that enough. It is the biggest mistake people make. <clears throat> okay, this is not a design class. I am not a designer. I'm not even really a good photographer. <laughs> so but I'm going to show you some examples of some of these things that you can utilize for yourself. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. Um, color. You're familiar with the color wheel. There's contrasting colors. There's analogous colors. It means they're next to each other on the color. You don't have to know that. It makes absolutely no difference. Pick whatever colors you like. 
or whatever combination you like. That's what's important. Texture. Different plants have different textures, different foliage. You can utilize that to make your gardening. Form. Is it rounded? Is it base shape? Is it upright? Is it trailing? Is it brown color? It's red. Massing. Massing can create a very formal looking garden. I will show you a thing. Done by plant, picking three to five species that you like, preferably that bloom about the same time, and planting three to five of each species. Okay. Recitation can be done with color or texture, but again, something to draw your eyes in here. And a focal point, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Oh, Jenny, what did you do? I mean, I took away the put the, the white on the screen there. That was click anywhere. Okay. Um, so this is an example of analogous color, meaning they're next to each other on the color wheel. Um, as we go through these, if you're new to native plant gardening, I'm going to explain when they bloom and a little bit about them, and you can kind of identify if there's some of these plants that you want to put in your garden or not put in your garden as a species. Upper left corner, New England Aster and Cardinal Flower. So this is a late summer picture, late summer, early fall. Um, and there's purple cone flower heads that they're already done. Okay. New England Aster is a big plant. It can be cut back early in the year to keep it a little bit shorter. But even then, it's a big plant. You're talking five feet high, five feet wide. Enough. So make sure you have room for it. But it's a fabulous pollinator plant. When it blooms, it's just covered in bees and butterflies. Just covered. Cardinal flower, of course, is a favorite of a hummingbird. Second picture is two yellows. We've got Golden Alexander in the back, which is a nice rounded mound with tiny, delicate little yellow flowers. Um, and then we've got golden brown fell in front with its upright stalks, about a foot high of uh, daisy shape for one of the better word, flowers. Well, this is early spring, both of these. Again, we talked about having something for those queen bees. This, these are great. Plus, black, the, um, golden Alexander is a host of black flowers open. Okay, wild bergamot and purple coneflower. Almost the same color, but two totally different things to be tested. So they, and they do at the same time, so they work really well. Um, down to the bottom left, two different blues. We've got, this is again a spring picture. Did I do that again? Oh, God. Well, I'm trying to help here. <laughs> This is pretty blue star, but they used to call it red leaf blue star. Um, tiny little blue flowers in the spring, very delicate, almost needle like color. Um, Stays in a nice rounded mound as it grows. Next to it, there's blue wild indigo. This is the most vivid blue we have ever seen. It is gorgeous. And the stalks will go upright, and they're just, the bees love them, they're just beautiful. This picture is again late summer. We've got plant milkweed and cardinal flower. These are both that these two like it hot and dry and very well drained. These two like a little moisture. They will grow an average to wet soil. Uh, so the swamp milkweed is little mounds of rosy pink flowers with clusters. And then of course the cardinal flower is upright with its trumpet shaped blue. And over here, we have Royal Catch Fly. Colors are coming a little bit on that, but um, red star shaped flowers. And then the uh, fuzzy wand of Cherry Blazing Star. Do you know this hummingbird here? Okay. Hummingbirds love my yard. I have Royal Catch Fly going on most of the summer. And as soon as it dies down, the cardinal flower needs to be gone. They have a few of these.
Okay, these are contrasting colors. Um, so here's some friendly French blue star again, this little mound. In between, there are some spikes of salvia, and you might well, that's not native, but you know. I slowly converted my yard. I was taking this one away. But upright wands, but this creates a different look in the garden. Um, and then with the blanket, these gray with this flat kind of fringe flower. This is Woodland Spider Court, and again, Golden Alexander, both spring bloomers, pretty early spring. Um, this is a Late summer fall picture. You've got the purple of New England Aster and the upright blonde of Chevy Goldenrod. Almost all goldenrods are yellows in some shade or another. Almost all asters, with a couple of exceptions, are shades of purple. So they contrast really well together and they bloom at the same time, which just makes it really convenient. Okay, this is. Little blue stem. So we want to actually have a bluish cap if you've ever seen little blue stem. It's so pretty in the garden. Behind the goldenrod. Now, the goldenrod does not grow this way. I cropped it up, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, and then over here, we have Helen flower and his flower. In contrast, in late summer, Helen's flower stays in a nice, clean, tiny clump. This flower goes everywhere. But it's pretty. Okay, here again, we have royal catch fly, and this is orange cone flower. Close to each other on the color wheel, but different heights, different shaped flowers. This is Lansley Coriopsis with its flat, fringed flowers with the cup shaped magenta flowers of purple cotton. Very striking. Um, purple poppy mallow, if you want to plant this, just be warned, it expands to like four times its size. Mm -hmm. Literally four times its size. When it's done blooming, you can cut it back at the, the strands back and you can get sometimes a second smaller than that. Okay, here we have the purple poppy mallow again, and the upright blue spikes of the pickle plant. This is the end of the time. Down here, another spring blooming picture. We have golden alexander again, and we have blue flag iris. Um, the only way I can describe it, iris flower. Everything is iris flower. But the foliage looks like striking. You have a tall, word shaped leaves. This a real statement in the garden. Here we have cardinal flower upright again, and Texas green eyes. So this again is a late summer, early fall picture. The Texas green eyes is also propped up because it will fall over. <laughs> and then the other corner part of this is so fuzzy, but it's orange cone flower, purple cone flower, two cone flowers, different colors. Purple cone flower is much taller. And I toss this in. This is a shrub. This is wild hydrangea. Big heart shaped leaves, white lace cap type flowers. When it's blooming, the bees literally dance all over the tops of those flowers. It is fun to watch. Um, but the foliage looks great even when it's not. Blooming. And then down in front here, we have the red and yellow flowers of Indian pink. And then over here, that isn't blooming yet. The down the snow cap, which will be moved after the wild hydro. So the bees can move from one to Okay. There's a lot of plants here. We need to try to put them on. Slender Mountain Mint. Again, they resistant. Tiny white flowers. Skinny, needle like foliage. Very fine texture. The native Pucara, Alamur, Corobellus. With this ruffled leaves, small mound. Okay, shining blue star. This is obviously done blooming. This is a spring bloomer. Um, by the way, if you plant shining blue star, when it's done blooming, you cut it back by half. 
and it will keep it in a more compact shape. It won't bloom again, but they don't bloom again any better. Um, this is Bush's poppy metal, same magenta cup shaped flowers, a purple poppy metal, but they get taller. And again, this is product, not product like that. And back here, the big, almost tropical looking leaves of prairie dawn. This really makes a statement in the garden that you've got to have room for it. It's a pretty big plant. So those two leaves. <laughs> And then late summer, it will shoot up a stalk about seven feet high with the flower. Um, I put this in here. Wild bergamot's done. I put the back with some purple colored flowers, some orange colored flowers. There's some garden plots back here. There's some gray, this is gray golden mud, which is yet to bloom. Um, this is wild spana. That's part of the reason I put in here. Tall plant. So again, half the distance of your, of your bed. Keep that in mind. But look at those compound leaves. They're fantastic. And you can cut some of that earlier in the year. And down here we have a And there's a focal point. I have this trellis with a vine growing up, but it goes very far along. So we had bird houses. A little more <laughs> repetition can be form, color, or texture. So, here we have friendly blue star and blue wild indigo. That combination is repeated. There's other things going on in between that combination. So, um, this is prairie drop seed. So, again, repetition. Here's the prairie drop seed with the bean head on it. And then there's gray golden rice also around your eye on the bed. This is repetition that I didn't do. This is box club beard. It reseeds somewhat vigorously, so it repeats itself. <laughs> and native plants will do that for you. It's awesome. Okay, we talked about mapping for a formal look. Three to five species. Three to five on each plant, preferably blooming all about the same time. That's one way to achieve a formal look. And this is my front yard. We've got Columbine, um, the little spider work up there, but Robin's planting, golden ground cell, pussy cell. They would be sold again being a little plant for page lady butterflies, ground cell for the early bees. This is, I think this is a March photo, it's pretty early. I do want you to know the bench and right here, see that piece of rock that's a bubbling mountain. Just some more examples of mapping. And again, these are not native. And uh, tree big plots. There's some uh, friendly blue stars in the blooming. Um, you can't see it there, well, but it's actually landscape for that. Just the idea behind that is to create lots of color. And the help to create a formal This is the map of the plant leaf coriopsis and clubs going on either side of a walkway to end at the map of the bottom wall. And a bit, if you want to sit down and look at it. Okay, tell me what you see. Texture. texture. Thank you. Lots of texture. What else? Um, it, leaf difference, the types of leaf. That's texture. Yeah, texture. Well, different forms. Different forms. Yeah. What's not here? Flowers. Flowers. Color. Color, yeah. This photo was actually taken in early July in a week when I just was between the spring stuff and the later spring <laughs> stuff, and I just happened to have a week when there was nothing blooming. But this is not boring. Um, the only reason I know that is that the Texas Tree Nine is starting to bloom up here and they start blooming. So, um, but you've got the mounds here of the fringe blue star with the yellow indigo in between. You've got the upright stalks of blazing stars. There's a couple of different kinds back there. The kind of prickly, spiky, if you will, sky blue aster, um, royal catch fly, which will start blooming shortly. 
wild sad idea with the big compound leaves. And then down here, there's Mexican hat, and I had to do something like that. But looks, is it pussy tail? No, no, but anyway, I'm just saying it's pretty to look at, even though we're from color. That's what's nice. If you still need help on the drone native website, there are landscape plans for almost any situation. Um, and they can be adapted as needed. Bring up the hummingbird ones if you're in. This is set for a 10 foot by 5 foot space. Now, if you don't have that much space, obviously you're going to cut this down. You're probably going to leave out the uh, red buckeye tree, you might leave out some of the taller plants like blue sage. Maybe you'll only do one wild bird plant. Um, maybe you just want to stick with the shorter plants, like columbine, purple beard tongue, rose verbena, fox rose beard tongue, raw catch fly. Um, you probably will leave out the fellas with the vine if you don't have that much space. The point is, these plants are adaptable. And you can substitute plants if you need to. Um, but I want to talk about all this empty space. Um, all of these plants, with the exception of purple beard, and the vine and the tree, will reproduce vigorous and make lots of babies. And they will fill in this empty space. And that's okay, because if you have your space covered by plants, what don't you have? Weeds. Weeds, yeah. No weeds. So the more plants, the better. And if you still need help, this is a pollinator garden menu card that's on the Grow Native website. It's designed to fit a three by five or three by six space. You pick three from each column, Okay, then you have something moving. The only things you have to watch for here is some of these. You have to watch the sun and the shade, okay? And just watch your height so that you're, you know, varying the height to you that you're not picking all tall places or all for. That's just a very helpful, helpful guide to get you going. Okay. You know, a lot of people say they don't like natives because they're weak. Well, there's ways to keep them from looking weak. And I'm going to start over here on the right with edging or borders. This is a phenomenal way to make your garden look new paint. Okay. Um, this is about a tiny to reserve. What's behind here is a little wilder, but there's a mass very drop seed right in front. And what do we say in that the garden look like? Formal. Formal. Okay. Well, that's a great way to define space. This is a pollinator garden that a young man put in for his grandmother. And he noticed the spacing between plants. This is a new bed, so there's room for stuff to grow. But he went to the effort of putting brick all the way around. That was not particularly easy. Okay. But it makes a very nice bed. Um, I don't have that much. <laughs> um, you'll see a lot of this in my yard. This is heavy metal edging. You get it at the hardware store. It's not in the garden section. They usually keep it over where the lawnmowers and the lawn sweaters and those kinds of things are. But it's solid, it's durable, it stays out all the time. You can weed whack right up against it. It's just indestructible. You can bend it so it flexes, so you can create the curve. This is fabulous. It's expensive, worth the money. And this looks like there's edging here and there's not. This is what we call a spade edge. Makes a nice edge to a garden if you don't want to invest in edge. So, how do you do a spade edge? It's a trusty flat blade shovel like that. And say the grass is going to pull this up. So your grass is over here. You're going to come down straight against your grass, down about four inches to get below the roof. Okay. Then you're going to come back. Okay. You're going to make a very sharp angled cut. There's not much space there, about two and a half inches down. 
and you're going to remove this little wedge that's in between and just close on it. And that's what you end up getting is you have this little crevice. This is great if you mulch your bed because any excess mulch falls into that crevice and not into your bed. They do have to be refreshed every two or three years. Oh, sorry. Okay, make your garden space intentional. Put something there that people would know that you put there, be it a gaming ball, a statue, artwork, a sculpture, a garden flag. I don't care what, a decorative rock. I don't care what it is, but put something there that says, I put this here. And that people will know it's part of your garden. A um, butterfly house. Got a rabbit turtle. There's a, I don't know if you can see it, but um, wrong thing. All right. Um, sign right here that says slow traffic. I don't even like turtles. We have box turtles in the yard. So, you know, you can walk around. Um, any questions? Okay. Make your garden inviting. If people want to spend time in it. Um, Curves, flagstone pathway leading down to a garden. It says, follow me down, come look at me. Um, a bench to sit on and enjoy the garden. All my garden beds have edging. Either metal edging or in this case, the bench plant is there to hold the garden. What happens within the bed? I try to a certain extent to let happen. I do a little editing occasionally, but I try to let the bed evolve as it wants to. But it stays contained in the bed. Like the only grass I have left in my yard is half through my yard. Um, there are a couple of really good ways you can let the garden look intentional. And mm -hmm. they spell the landscape sign. Wild ones. Wild ones. I'm sorry. Look at that. Wild ones. Remember the hat I have on. Okay. Um, so, native landscape for the benefit of wildlife and people. That's a great way to tell you, especially in the front yard, tell your neighbors what you do. Okay. And I'm going to start with the ID thing project, which is a cooperative effort with grow native. Um, again, Especially if you have a front yard bed to identify your plants, it's a great way to let your neighbors know what's going on. Okay. okay. Um, remember that mapping picture? Well, here it is a little later in the summer. Golden ground cells and the robin's lady and the pussy cells are all done blooming. Other things are coming on. But now you can see the bubbler, where earlier you couldn't see. So, and there's a bench that says sit down and watch the birds. I actually taught my neighbor, one of my neighbors doing that. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, David, that's what it's for. Absolutely, enjoy it. Bottom corner. Um, this is an entryway. So we have an arbor. There's actually a vine growing on it. And a stone pathway. But you can't see the rest of the yard because of this scrub here. So this says, come and see what's back. Talk about maintenance. Native gardens are low maintenance. They are not no maintenance. <laughs> Anybody who tells you otherwise. Okay. First and foremost, if you're going to do this, no pesticides, no herbicides, no fertilizers, no synthetic chemicals whatsoever. They are deadly to bees. And why did we say bees were important? Our food. Our food. Yeah. So um, if you feel like you need to feed your garden compost, particularly organic compost, if you really feel like you have a pest problem, there are some organic products on the market now. So you can make homemade ones that aren't quite so detrimental to the bees. But 
If you plant enough stuff in your garden and have some diversity, you will bring in enough good bugs that will take care of the bad bugs and you'll find your garden getting better all by itself. This is an example of green malt. This is cedar bed that I have planted underneath the shrub bed. And this is only second year picture, so it's actually filled out a little more. It's really pretty left. It's like a green carpet under there. The beauty of that is it suppresses the weeds and you don't have to buy mulch or get it delivered and spread it or do whatever else it is you need to do with mulch. Okay. Um, and this still allows, this leaves enough open space for the bees. Mulch is bad for bees. They can't dig through it. They're nesting, but they can get through the strands of cedar sedge. And that's not What about leaf mulch? Better when you chop up the leaves. Better, but if you pile mulch on too heavy, so what most people tend to do is fill it out. It's a bare space. You need to get even easier. Bare space. Okay. Um, I talked about cropping up plants. If this goes around, the bush is cropping now. You can see this. It kind of blends into the landscape. That's called a jardine hat round. They are only available in this country from Gardner Supply Company online. They A-R-D-I-N. They are the sole distributor in the United States. I think these come from France. But these are heavy enough. <laughs> To hold up that heavy plant. I even use them to prop up shrubs. They're very, very sturdy. And believe me, I have used every plant support on the thing from the planet. <laughs> Where did you say the website? Gardener Supply Company. So you have your plant, it's falling over. You're going to slide this underneath, lift it up, stick it in the ground, mm -hmm. and it's going to disappear into the landscape. Pretty much. Okay. Can you spell that again? J A R D I N. Yeah, I've got little smaller versions of those at Rolling Ridge. Did you? They're not super heavy duty, but they're, they're metal and they've got a the plastic coating on them. They're green. Ah, they're heavy duty enough to hold up a Senna. That's that's good. Senna's not particularly heavy, but I even use those on shrubs to hold to pop up shrubs that are falling over. So. Yeah, if you can find metal ones, don't bother with the <laughs> Okay. Um, what I wanted to point out here is this can't do with all this technology. Um, Thunder Mountain Mint. Um, this is a sidewalk, and it will, right next to the sidewalk, it will fall over, but you can't see what's holding it up. The picture down below. There's three stakes here. There's another one down here. The spring runs between the three stakes. But you can't see it. It disappears in the plant. But it's holding it up. And you can use a little bamboo stake for that. <laughs> However, most of the time in my garden, I don't bother with bamboo stakes. They just as far as I'm concerned, they're going to be the greatest thing you don't know about. That will say, you get these in the fencing section of the hardware store, not the garden section. But they'll hold up forever, and they're sturdy. Okay? And if you can see, you can see some of them. Um, but I have these all through my garden, and I use it to help keep a plant group together, help contain plants, separate different plants. Here, I'm using it to separate the rose turtle head from the rose mallow, from the blue star, from the clover group. And back here, there's actually two or three rows because I have sweet coneflower growing in cheers. The sweet coneflower you can cut back. And keep it shorter, so I cut the front one back pretty short, and then correspondingly the last one I need. But I have a cheer effect of sweet corn flour. Um, and 
Sometimes it's a group plan, sometimes it's a support of really tall plants, like a cup plant or a doe pie or currently top fire meat, something that needs more support. I don't need to for that. Ranges wine again at the hardware store. I go through this one of these a year probably. Find out why. But then I have a lot of money. Get the three. Don't get the brass. Yeah, get three. Okay. Last two slides. This is a picture taken from the back of my yard. This is in 2014. I was looking a while this evening. Um, there is a butterfly garden and that little rain garden that I showed you pictures of up here. This is the large rain garden, and this is only its second year. It's coming up again in the second spring, but you know, well on its way. You do have a pond. You know that there's nothing here. This little tree here is on this side of the pond, and that's a dogwood. And Dogwoods don't like wet feet. And our pond overflowed four times that summer. And the dog was not happy. And in fact, at the end of the summer, my husband pulled this eight foot tall tree out of the ground with one knee. So that all by it. So don't put a dog where we're gonna get wet feet. Okay, it likes well drained soil. But we, you know, we put another tree down here to put in the rock over it. It's still a little better. But there's nothing up here. And we've arborvitae here. Arborvitae do not like St. Louis. I don't care what anybody tells them. They do not like St. Louis and they take copious amounts of water to survive. Okay? You ever gone down the road and seen a row of arborvitae and one's dead in the middle? Yeah. That's what happens. <laughs> they do not like St. Louis. They're fickle. Okay. I just want you to notice some of these things. And I'm going to show you. Okay, right here we have two trees with a red buckeye and a French tree that are just came, starting out growing. And over here, you see the is a red oak tree. So my husband brought this tree home from Michigan. We went up to close the cottage at the end of the season, and it was bent over like that. Sure. Like a shepherd. And I looked at him and went, What were you thinking? And he said, It was on sale. Uh, <laughs> what were you doing? It's great. Well, he did. It's nice and great. The problem is that Michigan born tree was never happy here in Missouri. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't why. <laughs> so, this is my local eco pet story. Red oak is native all across the eastern United States and a little bit across the Mississippi. But get the tree near where you live. You should get all your plants within a 200 mile radius, ideally, where you live. That's called local ecotype, better adapted to the little minute variants in conditions. Okay, so this poor little tree moved out every spring beautifully, and then the eastern yellow bell fell off. <laughs> so eventually it got pulled out. And it's been replaced with a native swamp lighter. Okay. Got a good look at this? That's what my yard looks like today. Here, the buckeye and three trees over here somewhere, but this has all been incorporated into another pollinator bed. We have a shrub back there behind the bed shielding from the house. There's also a tree here providing the shade. Um, the arborvitae are gone and they've been replaced by fragment sumac and nine bark. This is the big rain garden. But the, the path is still there, the bench is still there. And of course, that's one of them. <laughs> still there. This yard does a great job of supporting wildlife. But it also does a great job of supporting people. It's very important for all of us that we spend some time outside. Just been proven to reduce anxiety, increase stress, get some time to enjoy your yard. Yay. 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 Any questions? Oh, good. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I have a 
has one and it seems to be struggling. The reason that people appears to be a full sign. Is it a well? It can be summer day. Oh, do that thing about red buckeye. Uh, the bird seems to be struggling. Red buckeye can grow in sun or shade. It's a small tree, only gets about a few feet tall. Red tubular flowers in the spring that bloom just about the time the hummingbirds come back. They're pink beautifully. If it's struggling, I don't know what kind of soil you have in it or what kind of moisture it's getting. It does like a little bit of moisture. Yeah. That is very, very dry. Well, yeah, you might want to try water in it. Yeah, it does, it does like a little bit of moisture. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, go ahead. Um, you mentioned keystone species and how they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, number one, number one on the hip parade is an oak tree. You got to be about keystone species. Then tell me if you read either of those books, right. we'll tell you oaks are number one in terms of supporting an infection caterpillar. Number one, they support over 500 species of caterpillars. And the good news is everybody has room for an oak tree. Because they now have a dwarf chinkapin oak only a few feet tall. So even if you don't have a lot of room for a big oak tree, you can still have them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, number two on the list is prunus species. We're talking cherries and plums. Black cherry is a medium sized tree, it's about 80 feet tall, but supports over 500 species of insects and birds. Fabulous. Quality. Okay. And wild plum, of course, in the spring. Um, again, great pollinator. So those are the top two on that list in terms of providing support for the insect level of life. Is that what you're asking about? Well, or? yeah, but, yeah. but that, just besides the trees, aren't there plants that they consider like the asters and the golden rods? Or there are certain ones that they yeah. think are asters. Uh, golden rods are probably number one in terms of the perennial world. Um, they support over 100 species of insects. Category. Um, number two is the asters. Um, number three is the eucatoriums or the eucatorium with jopi and bolicet and those kinds of things. And I don't remember what the rest of them are, but yes. Um, yeah. All right, so one question was, could you use a thought cutter? Yeah, you could absolutely use a thought cutter, but you still got to scrape the thought with the grass off. Thought cutter is a great way to outline your bed and get it started, but you still have to scrape off the ground. The next question is, do you cut back the blue sage to make it more compact? You could. It's a very late summer blooming species, so you could cut it back. I do not because mine is the back of the bed when it's like it's Anything that blooms late summer or fall. Now, as soon as I get it, I'll think of something you can. But really, they can be cut back to be kept shorter. You cut them back in the spring. Don't do it too late. Uh, if you do it in July, you cut off all the respective blooms. But you can do it early in the year. In fact, my New England after I cut back twice, once in March, once in May. And it's still five foot tall. If I didn't cut it back, I didn't do that one year. You know, the big. Anything else? No, that's it. Do you cut back most of the native plants? No. You mean everything in my gardens? Everything in my garden stays up through the winter. Yeah. It is all cut back that provides the birds will still pick up the seed heads. There are insects living in that they put it out underneath. So it provides homes for bugs. Everything gets cut back. Late winter, very early spring, when you start to see signs of new growth. So you do cut everything back yeah. at that point. Yeah. But when you do cut it back, woody species, cup plant, wing wind aster, um, iron weeds. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, leave about 15 to 18 inches tall. It'll look ugly for about two weeks, but that's important for those cavity nesting bees. They will come out and they fold in those cells. Um, and within two weeks, everything will be grown up. Anybody else? Anybody else? So you shouldn't, 
disturb the, the, the leaves around your native plants? Absolutely. And how do they grow up? And they, they'll come right through it. Don't worry about it. That's why you don't use mulch. They'll come, they'll come through the leaves that are just fine on their own. Um, it took me a long time to convince my husband that these do not clean out those beds in the fall. He was like, well, top up the leaves and put them back. No, that's too late. You've already disturbed all the insects under there. Just leave it. Leave it. Well, the only time that matters is if you're trying to germinate certain types of seed that require to be scratched clean. Like yeah, a I cardinal start, flower. I start cleaning like that. Yeah, <laughs> I and I, I don't. So I there are some areas that I I do kind of muscle around. Yeah, so what we're on the topic of cardinal flower. Everybody says cardinal flower doesn't last very long. So how do you get more cardinal flower other than growing up from seed? When it's about to go to seed in your garden. You go out and you either pull some leaves around it because you'll have some leaves in the floor, or you take a rake and you scrap the dirt around it because cardinal flower seeds like to fall on disturbed soil. And that's how you get more cardinal flower. Scott, what area are we setting? We want bluebells to spread mm -hmm. right through the leaves late February. And that mimics what happens in the river bottoms and the river floods. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you want to leave that stuff during the winter for those bugs that live there. Okay. Um, the only time you might make an exception for that is if you've got, and I'm still having to say that, a front yard bed that you need to keep clean for your neighbors. I use a tiny bit of mulch only in the front half of my front yard. People are used to seeing plants with mulch around them. But I don't like mulch. Mulch is not good for bees, remember? So I don't use mulch anywhere else in my yard. But right in the, like the front half of my front yard, I put a little bit of mulch. And it's not a lot. A little bit of mulch just to, you know, get you my hand. Do you keep bees clean out of the rain garden? No, you leave them. They'll disintegrate. The water will disintegrate. Yeah. Some of the bad ones. In the picture that you're looking at, do not even fall into a sense booth that we did everything instantaneously. We did a plus year. A little bit each year, because I don't, I'm not made of money. Had a lot of trial and error to yeah. kind of get what you wanted. We had a lot of trial and error. And we had we had fun just working it through and then adjusting as we came into what happened next year. And I used to worry about moving native plants um, on the train for them to survive <laughs> until I discovered that yeah, we can move. I can move. The only thing you can't really do that with are things that put down a tabret like the baptisia and the butterfly mold. Everything else. It's not in the right place. It's just right plant in the right place. You know, sometimes that's trial and error. Um, we pick the project every year. Sue picked the project. <laughs> <laughs> they did all the research in the in the winter and stuff that then I hear the picture go make me this. This bed right here. Um, I decided to get put the, the waterfall stream on it. And we were enjoying nature so much. And the birds would come and the toads would come and later. I we were just enjoying it. I thought I want a butterfly garden to go along with all this. So I had no idea what I was doing. Wasn't even much of a gardener. So I went around to nurseries. This was June already. So stuff was already kind of picked up. I went around to nurseries and bought stuff and thought it was good for I came home, called up a friend of mine who was a master gardener and unbeknownst to me in the natives. And I asked her if she would help me lay out my butterfly. And she said, sure, what do you got? So I told her. And she went, hmm, 
which should have been my first clue. <laughs> okay, but she came over and she brought some what she called natives with her. And I had never heard of natives, but she helped me lay out the bed. We incorporated her natives into it. Um, she stayed to help plant it, which I thought was really nice. Um, we went to lunch, came back, and the thing, I swear to God, was covered in butterflies. It was like validation that I was trying to do the right thing. Okay. Uh, from her war on, the stuff I bought pretty much gave up. The stuff she bought was rolling strong. So I called her and I started asking questions. And she brought me some more. She was really good about carrying this thing. And she brought me my first cardinal flower. Well, when that bloomed late summer and I felt a hummingbird on it, and that was there, there's no going back. <laughs> so, obviously, over time, we took all the non natives out of the bed and converted it all. And, and there's, there's a few non natives left in my yard um, just because the candy cup is really hard to get out of the bird holding up the pond, so I'm not even going to try. And then I have some little um, monkey face iris from my monkey. So, you know, and there's a couple of boxes just for a structural. So they're not, not 100% native, but pretty good. I do have platinum certifications from Marine Conservation Home. Got that a few years ago. Any other questions? I have a question, but it's more for wild women. So I have an area that's um, 30 feet by 30 feet. How can I get help putting that all into native plants? That grow native resource guide over on the table yeah. um, lists contractors that will work with native plants. Um, start calling now because they look up pretty fast. And uh, I'm just trying to up here if anybody wants them. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you to Sue, and um, you may be hearing from Sue as time goes on because she is also our outreach chair, and so you'll, you'll be noticing some uh, oh, requests for volunteers to help with tabling, some of the informational tabling efforts. Um, maybe also you'd like to volunteer to help with packaging the uh, name tags that, that will be um, needing to package and ship as the store gets going. Um, so once we get those online, and the store's up and running, um, we will be opening up to grow native numbers as well. So we have the, 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 the folks at home can do that. Oh, and, um, <laughs> once we get the store up and running, um, it will allow grow native members to order. So we anticipate that there will be some orders coming in from grow native folks as well. And meanwhile, just remember our website, poke around. Um, there's a resources tab that has more for you to look into than you would ever begin to have time enough to do, but poke around in that. And um, Penny was reminding me to tell all of you to not feel shy about using the contact us on our website. Uh, if you have questions, you know, about, about what the what the chapter is doing, or we, we can often refer you to somebody if it's not pertinent to the chapter. So don't feel shy about using the contact us. And um, have a good, yeah. Kind of uh, no, it's a ways away. I assume there's going to be a uh, native plant sale at Shaw Nature Reserve Mother's Day weekend. Yeah, no, it's a week earlier this year. They're taking it uh, off Mother's Day weekend and then putting it the first weekend in May. But still Friday, Saturday. So, and are we going to have a sale of wild ones? Okay. Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, what about the usual um, Mother's Day plant sale at Shaw Nature Reserve? Sue was updating that uh, it is going to be a week earlier um, this year. And then Kevin's other question was about whether we would be participating in having our usual uh, Wild One Singles chapter sale at that. And yes, we will. Is that, uh, is, you know, is there a calendar? I mean, if you can. So, you know, there is a calendar on our website now. 
It's not on there, but it's you can go to national. The national website has our passenger on. So the plant that will it's the fifth and yeah. sixth. It is May fifth and sixth. Yeah, May fifth and sixth. They're taking it off Mother's Day weekend. I think that's going to stay going forward. Mm -hmm. Just so you know. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I may, community news, I'm hosting a American Red Cross blood drive here at the rec center this Friday from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. to work. We're looking for blood donors. So if you have nothing else to do Friday, please come on up. If you go on the American Red Cross looking for a blood drive, the zip code here is 63144, and you'll find us. Pick a slot, I can use some, uh, some more bodies. <laughs> I like the lot. Yeah, I do. I want to do more. <laughs> and I hope to see, is there something else? Okay. Hope to see um, many of you or and all of you in February when our speaker uh, for the month will be at Speedback. The uh, Curator of invertebrates at the St. Louis Zoo. We'll be talking about bees and other pollinators. So join us then. Meanwhile, be safe.